pictures we can actually look at and compare directly against a suspect item. Having identified a match between the two samples, there was further compelling evidence to link Marshall to the murder scene. In addition to finding flock fibres, we found a number of green polyester fibres and green cotton fibres, which were subsequently found to match this green polo shirt, which belonged to Stephen Marshall. The evidence was overwhelming and placed Stephen Marshall at Geoffrey Howe's flat at the time the body was being dismembered and wrapped up. But while fibre evidence implicated Marshall as the murderer, back in Dundee, Sue Black and her colleague Lucina Hackman were making some startling discoveries about the body parts. Most dismemberments are unsuccessful or haphazard at best because most individuals do not appreciate how difficult it is to separate the human body. If you think, right, I'm going to take a leg off, how do you do it? Well, you just cut across the thigh. And you might cut across the tissue, but once you get down to the bone, that bone's really tough. You can't cut through it with a kitchen knife. In most dismemberments, we expect to find those elements that show this person didn't know what they were doing. With the Jeffrey Howe case, we did not find that. So, for example, most of us in the public would find it very difficult to find where that junction is between the lower end of our radius and ulna and the start of our carpal bones, the radiocarpal joint at the wrist. Most of us would make several attempts and wouldn't get it right. And each one of those attempts would be recorded on the bone because you'd have that cut mark left. Marshall found it first time. The body was dismembered at the joints. There was no cutting of the bone. And that's what takes a time in a dismemberment, is cutting through bone. You need an implement that will actually saw through the very large bones of the lower limbs, for example, and the larger bone of the upper limb. In this case, because um, the individual went through the joint capsules, all it meant was cutting through soft tissue and cartilage and then separating the body at those spaces. So the dismemberment could have been done in a couple of hours easily by somebody who knew what they were doing. I've been an anatomist for oh, at least 25 years, I would say, and I've seen quite a number of dismemberment cases. I have never, ever seen anything at this level of skill that I think if I was given this task, if I had to do this, would I have done this any differently? And the answer is no, I wouldn't have done it any differently. He did it perfectly. And would I have done it any better? No, I couldn't have done it any better. So this is someone who, as an anatomist, I'm looking at an equal in terms of skill. And that's quite chilling. The forensic team's investigations had raised further questions for the police force. A line of inquiry was to try and establish whether or not Marshall had any uh, background in knowledge of anatomy, whether he'd previously been a, a, a butcher, gamekeeper, something along those lines. But no evidential link was established there. This left no logical explanation as to how Marshall had acquired these skills and investigations into his past continued. On the 1st of May 2009, Marshall and Bush appeared in Stevenage Magistrates Court. They both entered a plea of not guilty and at the prosecution's request, it was January 2010 before the case went to trial. Right from the start of the trial, there were surprises, even before the jury had been sworn in. Marshall had originally pleaded not guilty to everything, um, but on the first day, he changed his plea and he admitted dismembering the body. What he didn't admit to was the murder. Stephen Marshall and Sarah Bush were being held pending trial for the murder and dismemberment of kitchen salesman Geoffrey Howe in March 2009. The pair had pleaded not guilty at an initial hearing and a prosecution case was being mounted against them. On January the 12th, 2010, the case was due to begin here at St Albans Crown Court. Just prior to the court case starting, uh, both Bush and Marshall needed to uh, 
present us with a defence case statement. During that defence case statement, Bush was claiming that Marshall had carried out the murder, and Marshall was claiming that Bush had carried out the murder. It's what the prosecution called a cutthroat defence, where you have two people suspected of a crime, and they both blame each other. So they're effectively pointing the finger of blame at the co-defendant, and uh, their legal team will be um, adducing all evidence that they can that blames the co-defendant. So effectively they're, they're carrying out some of the role of the prosecution in a cutthroat defence because they're blaming each other and that evidence gets presented to the jury. This tactic was not seen as unusual, but there was one twist from the outset that was not expected. One of the few journalists who attended the entire court case was Rosa Silverman. Right from the start of the trial, there were surprises, even before the jury had been sworn in. Marshall had originally pleaded not guilty to everything, but on the first day, he changed his plea and he admitted dismembering the body. What he didn't admit to was the murder. Right from the start, we had a slightly bizarre situation where he had actually admitted cutting somebody up but claimed that he was uh, not guilty of murder. And we all learnt of that before the jury had heard anything. And then there were three more weeks in which Marshall maintained that while he had cut up the body, he hadn't actually been guilty of the murder. He seemed pretty impassive. He, was, um, he looked resolute. He looked like he was concentrating very hard. He was taking it all in. He looked very serious, but he didn't betray any emotion and he didn't look at Sarah Bush at all. The lack of a rapport between them in court, the lack of any kind of noticeable eye contact or exchange of smiles or exchange of any words or anything at all, suggests that relations between them had frozen somewhat since they were arrested and held in custody. As the case progressed, the prosecution witnesses painted a grim picture of Marshall's character. Marshall was known to us, he's got a history of, of violence, and again, that was evident in, in what the court heard throughout the time that the prosecution were presenting their case. Quite clearly, uh, he has a propensity to violence. You know, we, we heard about different levels of violence that he'd used to a number of witnesses that gave evidence during the trial. So a very manipulative, dangerous individual who wouldn't bat an eyelid at turning to extreme violence. But some of the most compelling facts presented to the court focused on Marshall and Bush's actions after the murder, which had left a significant trail of evidence. The evidential links showed that both Bush and Marshall were plundering all of Howe's assets immediately after his death. Not particularly intelligent, because that was always going to lead the police back to them. And the abuse of Jeffrey's assets, stealing his money, began less than a day after he was murdered. On the 9th of March, Marshall sold Jeffrey's phone for £15 at this shop. The following day, Sarah Bush used the internet at St Albans Library to buy a mobile phone using Jeffrey's account. Clothes were purchased online using his name and bank details and regular fast food and supermarket orders were made to various addresses connected to Bush and Marshall. And then the pair got greedier. They started writing cheques to themselves from Geoffrey Howe's account, including one for £850 deposited in Bush's account on the 12th of March. A week later, Stephen Marshall was captured on CCTV, paying in a cheque for just under £100 from Jeffrey's account into his own. Then, on the 21st of March, Marshall sold Jeffrey Howe's car via an online auction. When they sold Jeff's car, they sold that to a non-suspecting member of the public. But on the receipt was both Marshall and Bush's fingerprints which was key, obviously, from, from an evidential point of view, as we built the case around them. And before he sold the car, Marshall swapped the registration plates with his own ones. He was later spotted driving away from a petrol station without paying for the fuel, in his car now sporting Jeffrey's personalised number plates. About £5,000 is what Bush and Marshall had got away with 
what they uh, managed to access from Jeff's sort of personal accounts and so on. Not a significant amount of money, and you, you, you know it's just very difficult to comprehend how anybody can give that level uh, of violence to carry out the murder and then the dismemberment afterwards. It's unbelievable.